I'd like to welcome you to George's online service for December the 13th. It's the third Sunday of Advent. And I hope you'll join in the prayers and the songs and the words that will be shown on your screens. The theme of the third Sunday of Advent is joy, our anticipation for the coming of the Christ child. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Joy shall come even to the wilderness, and the parched land shall then know great gladness, as the rose, as the rose, shall deserts blossom, deserts like a garden blossom. For living springs shall give cool water in desert streams shall flow, for living springs shall give cool water, in the desert streams shall flow. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for today, God of unveiled truth in times of darkened sun and waning moon, lift up our hearts and waken our love to announce the coming dawn of unexpected peace. Through Jesus Christ, the one who is to come. Amen. On the first two Sundays of Advent, we have lit our candles of hope and peace. We light them again this morning and add to them our third candle, the candle of joy. We look forward to Christmas because it is a time of joy when we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world in human form. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord. Make a straight path for him, make a straight path. Prepare the way of the Lord. I thought I'd talk today about the meaning of Advent. The word actually just means coming. So when something's coming, it means that we're waiting for it. So Advent's a word that we usually use only in church. If I were to ask you what we're waiting for in Advent, you might reply Christmas or Jesus, and both answers would be okay. That's because Christmas is the day that we remember the birth of Jesus in a stable in Bethlehem. Now this third Sunday of Advent celebrates joy. I expect many people think that to themselves this year, there isn't much joy around, what with the pandemic and all the restrictions that have come along with it. If you start to think that way, you might get pretty depressed. But really, it's not all bad. We won't be seeing as many friends and family members as in person as usual. But thanks to technology, most of us will be able to keep in touch with family and friends. The wonders of Skype, WhatsApp and Zoom bring distant faces and voices right into our homes. Or we can talk to them by telephone. Now, if we couldn't, that would be a whole other level of missing out on joy. Yes, this year Christmas will seem very different. But we can still celebrate, we can still find joy. St George's will celebrate that wonderful birth of Jesus, God's real Christmas present to us. There's an old saying which is still true. 
that Christ is the reason for the season. Without God's Christmas present to us, we wouldn't have any reason to celebrate at all. No Christmas gifts, no special Christmas dinner. Now that would be a downer. So not everything is doom and gloom. Michelle and I have already started decorating our house. In our nativity set, the ox and the ass are already in the stable. Like us, they're waiting for the baby Jesus to come on Christmas Eve. But right now, the manger is empty. Jesus hasn't arrived yet. That's what we're waiting for. So, let's get excited like we always do before Christmas. And St George's will have our usual special Christmas Eve service online. I hope you'll be able to be with us on Christmas Eve. I'm really looking forward to it. No, it won't be the same as usual, but it still will be a joyful celebration. And that's what this third day of Advent reminds us, because the third day of Advent we celebrate joy. Amen. O come, divine Messiah, the world in silence waits the day when hope shall sing its triumph and sadness flee away. Dear Savior, haste, come, come to earth, dispel the night and show your face and bid us hail the dawn of grace. O come, divine Messiah, the world in silence waits the day when hope shall sing its triumph and sadness flee tell you the son can do nothing on his own but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does the son does likewise the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and he will show him greater works than these so that you will be astonished indeed just as the father raises the dead and gives them life so also the son gives life to whom whomsoever he wishes the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, and does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Very truly I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. The Gospel of Christ. Thank Today I want to speak about immorality. It's an immorality here in Canada. We have the resources and know-how to provide safe drinking water around the world when disaster strikes, but yet we ignore the lack of clean drinking water and safe drinking water in our remote First Nations communities. The homily follows on very directly, in my mind at least, from what I said last week. I'll repeat how I ended that, all, that homily. I quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Most Christians look for a, dis, a rather domesticated sort of Jesus. A great teacher and healing, inclusive, compassionate. And we think to ourselves, I could imagine myself being like that as a follower of Jesus. But then instinctively we shy away from the Messiah who asks us to risk everything, as Mark puts it, for the sake of the gospel. But I want to start this morning with today's passage from John's gospel, because it speaks to the authority of Jesus. And John makes it very, very clear. Jesus and the Father are one. He's on an equality with God. And it's an overarching theme of John's Gospel. And it began in the very first chapter, where John wrote that the Logos, the Word, was God, and had been God since even before the beginning of time. Here in chapter 5, Jesus had just outraged the Jewish authorities. He'd done two things. He'd first of all healed on the Sabbath, which was against the Sabbath rules. But then he said something absolutely outrageous, as far as they were concerned, at least. 
He said that God the Father continues to work on the Sabbath and that he and the Father are one. The other three Gospels also address the question of Jesus' authority, but they leave the answer hanging. Their context was somewhat different. In that case, Jesus had just overturned the money changers' tables at the temple. The temple authorities challenged Jesus and said, who gave you the authority to do these things? I assume that all Christians get the right answer. Jesus got his authority from God. But Matthew, Mark and Luke don't say so explicitly. In their scenarios, Jesus fenced verbally with the temple authorities. He wouldn't answer their question directly. Instead, he asked them whether John the Baptist acted on divine authority or human authority. And as I've said before, that was rather a trick question. Temple leaders couldn't give Jesus a straight answer, and so Jesus refused to answer them. I now want to take a slight detour. All the Gospels were written in the Greek language, in the style of the Greek biography of a great man. And this style comes out in the numerous arguments between Jesus and the temple authorities. Jesus always has the snappy con comeback, or the pointed put down. And I have to admit, this has always been something that I especially enjoy about reading the Gospel Scriptures, because Jesus, our hero, always gets the upper hand in his debates with the scribes and Pharisees. But when you look more closely, you see something else. Almost from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is in danger. The scribes and the Pharisees keep trying to catch him out. Threats of arrest and death are always in the background and sometimes not even in the background. It's especially noticeable in John's Gospel, and in fact today, the piece that we've just read is immediately preceded by the fact that the temple leaders wanted to kill Jesus, both because he healed on the Sabbath and because he claimed equality with God. I connected the threat of personal danger for Jesus to modern-day martyrs like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Oscar Romero. Their prophetic voices were like that of Jesus. Their public ministries also took place under the threats of arrest and death by the secular authorities. We're incredibly lucky in Canada. We don't have to face arrest or death for proclaiming our beliefs. But that doesn't mean that we don't have, we're not called upon sometimes to speak with prophetic voices. After all, the role of the Hebrew prophets was to critique Israel's leaders for not living up to God's standards. They didn't foretell the future, except sometimes they would point out the consequences of their leaders' immoral behavior. <clears throat> I have spoken many times about the fact that many of our remote First Nations communities do not have safe drinking water. We Southerners all take it for granted that when we turn on our taps, clean water will come out. Just imagine if that were not the case. It would be like living in cholera or typhoid-ridden cities like Toronto or Montreal over 150 years ago. So that makes it a national disgrace that in Canada in the 21st century, People should have boiled water advisories that last for decades. <clears throat> and that made me absolutely incensed recently when I read the following headline on page one of the Globe and Mail. Sanitation specialists develop system to ensure refugee camps anywhere have healthy drinking water. The newspaper cited the work of Dr. Saeed Imran Ali of York University. His technology uses computer assistance in the form of machine learning to optimize the guidelines of the World Health Organization to the specific site of the refugee camp. The World Health Organization standards apply to municipal waters in cities, which of course operate under fairly hygienic conditions. Yes, this is a good news story. People who have to flee their homes deserve access to safe drinking water, just like anyone else. But I note that Canadians developed the new technology. Canadian taxpayers paid for it. So why, I ask, is this good news not available to remote communities here in Canada? 
This isn't the first time that I've read about a situation like this. Canada's Disaster Assistant Response Team, known as DART, frequently flies portable water treatment plants to places where disasters like earthquakes or tsunamis have rendered water treatment plants and facilities inoperable. So again I ask, why can, why can we fly people around the world for humanitarian assistance, yet we cannot or will not do so for people who live here in, right here in Canada? What would I think if I were a First Nations person living without access to clean drinking water? Well, first, I think I'd be very angry. But more than that, I would feel that my health and that of my family was somehow unimportant to the powers that be. That I was unimportant because the Government of Canada refuses to acknowledge that the disaster in my community deserves the same response as one happening on the other side of the world. This is immoral. I want to raise my voice against this injustice. This is the Gospel message for today. Jesus said that as we do or don't do things for the least of his brothers and sisters, so we also do or don't do them for him. That's what we heard three weeks ago on the reign of Christ. No, I didn't have to risk my life to say this for the sake of the gospel, like Bonhoeffer or Romero, but it's important nonetheless to try to speak with the authority of the gospel. Amen. You come in peace and meekness and holy will. Let us pray. The response to each petition is prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. Prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. <clears throat> Loving God, today we lit the candle of joy. Christmas is a time to be joyful as we welcome Jesus to the world. The angel told the shepherds, that they brought good news of great joy. But it's hard to feel joy amid all the restrictions that we're faced with to limit the spread of COVID-19. <clears throat> we will miss many of the ways that we express love and joy in normal Christmases. Our gatherings at church, our extended family get-togethers, singing carols together, just to name a few. <clears throat> Please remind us when restrictions get us down that the joy of Christmas is not in the decorations or the food and drink or the gifts, not even in the gatherings, but in the coming of the Christ child. So this Advent, prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. We come today with thanks in our hearts. Thanks for all the good things you have given us, things that COVID restrictions cannot take away from us. We thank you for the necessities that sustain life, food, homes, warmth in winter. We thank you for the things that bring joy to our hearts, like beauty, creativity, music, for the hope, that comes from faith in you, for your peace that passes all our understanding, for the love of friends and family. And above all, as we wait for the birth of the Christ child, we thank you for your love shown in the coming of Jesus. Show us ways to share hope, 
joy, peace and love with others as we prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. Even as we share the joy we find in you with one another, we're mindful of those for whom joy is hard to find. Those who don't have enough clothes or food, who have no shelter or safety. Parents who are struggling to live up to their children's expectations this Christmas. The sick, the lonely, the depressed, those who are grieving. Help us to see Jesus in those around us, in everyone we meet during this season of giving. Give us grace to help them as we are able, not counting the cost to us as we prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. As we prepare for Christmas, decorating, baking, shopping, wrapping gifts and putting them under the tree, let us not forget to give intangible gifts that cannot go under the tree. These gifts will ring their way around the world. Forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Tolerance for those we don't agree with. Love to friends, good service to customers, smiles to all we meet. Yes, even behind masks, let our eyes shine. And respect to all and to ourselves. <clears throat> With these gifts, we can make the world a better place. We can work to bring God's kingdom here on earth. And we pray that you will prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. Advent God, we journey with you to Bethlehem stable to see a newborn king with our ears attuned to the sound of the songs of angels our eyes alert for Bethlehem's star. Forgive us if on our journey we are distracted by the tempting offers of this world. Keep our hearts aflame with the hope of Christmas and the promise of a savior in whose name we pray. Prepare our hearts to meet Jesus with joy. Amen. <clears throat> And now please join me as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Glory to God, who is power working in us, and do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God, from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, May God, our creating Father and Mother, Jesus, the brother and guide for whom we wait, the animating and inspiring Holy Spirit, shower down upon us blessings and joy in the hope of a bright future, today and every day. Amen. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. He comes to break oppression, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. 
Fountains from hill to valley 